Okay, let me please welcome everyone to this event uh, organized by the School of Business, our team is there, and the Department of Economics, and sponsored by Mr. Gustavo Diaz. Of course, we have two speakers, uh, Ms. Lori Goodman from Armstrong Security Group. Uh, she's been recently testifying at the U.S. Senate and is traveling a lot and is an expert in housing. Uh, she's a PhD from Stanford and an undergraduate from Penn. And to crank up the numbers, we have Mr. Carlos Sam Lutz that will be giving us a few estimates and we are looking forward to that. So Mr. Carlos Sam Lutz is a renowned CPA in the area. Well, what's the purpose of this event? And let me highlight just a couple of points from economics. The first one is that housing cycles are usually very long and painful. They may take over 10 years, and that's what we are going through here in Florida. The second point is that while uh, economists have learned a lot from previous crises, as to how to operate monetary policy, uh, it still remains, as a gray area, how to operate on the housing market. So Milton Friedman from the University of Chicago and many others did a lot of research about the Great Depression as to how monetary policies should be run. Mr. Bernanke seems to learn those lessons but uh, there is still here a puzzle with the housing market. What I want to say is that interest rates are low, but those low interest rates have not been passed on to homeowners. What are this, I mean, who does this mean for Florida? The Florida economy was posting nine three-point million jobs in September of 2011, and is posting 9.3 million jobs now. So it means that uh, the economy is not generating jobs. Uh, the Florida economy lost 500,000 uh, jobs since 2007. Of those 5,000 uh, uh, jobs, for, excuse, of those 500,000 jobs, half a million jobs, 400,000 belong to the construction market. So, in other words, the construction market can explain all problems of the Florida economy. If we talk to continental U.S., 20% of the construction jobs that have been lost have happened in Florida. So one out of five U.S. jobs uh, have been lost uh, in Florida. So if the U.S. is five, we are one. This means that 20% of the jobs have uh, been lost here in our state. Of course, if we go to uh, Miami-Dade County or South Florida, the situation is even much worse. 20% uh, of homeowners, as Lori will call us later, are underwater in um, the U.S. 40% are in Florida. So the numbers really go against the, our state. Uh, I'm going to, you see, anticipating the other speakers, I, I'm going to present here, sorry, is that, well, this is too far. Let me tell you a couple of things before. So this is the housing crisis, which is right in the middle of a banking crisis and a homeowner's crisis uh, due to foreclosures, okay? Uh, what probably uh, one should understand is that uh, banks are no longer banks, so they are servicers. So here the bank is an intermediary between a home buyer and uh, the bond market. Uh, 
And in terms of making loan modifications, uh, this is no longer possible with the bank. There are many people involved. What I was saying before is that the housing crisis, uh, you see, uh, four years ago was also an election year. And this was the year in which the banking system uh, imploded uh, due to the housing crisis. We are still with the same problems with the banking system and the housing market. A few statistics that probably later on uh, other speakers may uh, want to go over. Uh, the loss in housing prices in, in many areas of the US is been between 20 and 40 percent. Uh, part of the problem is the foreclosures, that uh, they are a big loss to the economy. And this is going to be coupled with weak US output growth and high unemployment. So this is a picture of the housing market. The peak is roughly in 2006. And it tells you that it's been going down uh, by almost 40%. This is for the whole US. However, and this is what I was saying uh, before, if we look at the stock market, which is the yellow line, uh, the stock market has rebounded. And this is a merit of monetary policy, which is the green light, the green line, and uh, interest rates have gone down to zero. And this has been good for the stock market. It hasn't been good for the housing market. So the question is why homeowners do not benefit from these lower interest rates, okay? Foreclosures are a problem. Uh, I don't know if we were to put numbers, it's like four million homes per year in 2009. They have gone down a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, unemployment is a problem for our state. It's coming down, but you see, in the eyes of, or in the mind of Mr. Bernanke, it's not clear how much unemployment is going to come down simply because uh, GDP, uh, the economy is not growing very much. So unemployment will not come down if the economy is not growing very much. Let me say a, a few more facts to give you an idea of the, the housing market has imploded to basically one third of what we used to have. Construction no longer contributes to economic growth. And uh, of course, there are many indirect jobs uh, generated by construction. And there is a loss of wealth uh, from home prices that is affecting consumption. So this is the picture of the economy. Uh, and of course, on top of that, there are many homeowners which are underwater. This is uh, the number of homeowners underwater, which is roughly 12 million uh, in the whole US, okay? And uh, here is the puzzle that you see we are trying to present here is that uh, long-term interest rates, Mr. Obama can borrow, or the government can borrow at 2%, but there are 30 million homeowners that uh, are paying over 5% interest rate. And the question is why homeowners are paying such a high interest rate if interest rates are low. And just to make the story simple, the answer is that you cannot refinance your property. So in order to access the low interest rates, one has to refinance the property, but there, are, there is insufficient collateral. Many other facts is that foreclosures are damaging the US economy. Some homeowners are th thinking um, of a strategic default, that it means to leave the property and rent a cheaper home. And therefore, homeowners and banks are in that fight of perverse incentives. You want to fight with your bank to pay less, and the bank wants to fight with you 
And on one hand, there is the threat of foreclosure. On the other hand, the bank realizes that you need to live in your property. So this is, in a way, what economists uh, refer to as toxic assets, where people try to fight each other, and they don't disclose enough information. And of course, there are perverse, perverse incentives. But what we know is that toxic assets poison or kill the markets. And this is where we are now. And the question is, what answers uh, should we expect? Lori was telling you a, a few minutes that probably we should expect little from the government. This is probably good for a healthy economy, but the government is trying to solve uh, the problem, of course, as every government. So the question is, uh, and, and this is, you see, the part of my talk, is that what are proposals by economists? And I think that the classical proposal uh, is the SAM programs. Uh, this is share appreciation mortgage. So uh, right now that you're underwater, a fraction of the property is going to go to the bank and you try to deal with each other. Uh, in my opinion, this uh, arrangement uh, is self-destructive because it implies multiple ownership with confronted interest. So if you have a share appreciation mortgage, you try to tell the bank that you don't have money to pay. The bank is also trying to nail you down. So this is a, really a perverse incentive, or it's not the optimal incentive. I, I write here that this is a version of Hotel California, if you re remember that song, uh, where you can never leave. So you're there but you're not allowed to leave. And so the parties are fighting among themselves. And as the song goes, it says they can't just kill the beast. So that's the situation of any SAM program, in my opinion. There are other programs of uh, loan reduction. Okay, but, but here is uh, one proposal. Uh, by Mr. Gustavo Diaz that I wrote down in a paper. So there are, in my opinion, six principles that uh, we are trying to uh, respect, or we are going to be sensitive. The first is a financial principle. If you, if your loan now, uh, excuse, if your home now is 40% less, there's no enough collateral, and therefore the loan should be restructured. So there is collateral for 60% of the property, so that 60% of, of the loan uh, is good, but the other 40% is no longer good, and something else must be done with the remaining 40%. I'll talk later about the 40%. So here the proposal is that there are two parts, part A and part B, and uh, the homeowner now has a property with 40% less, and therefore uh, this is going to be taken into consideration into part A. Uh, but it doesn't make sense uh, to have the same loan as before. Now, this is very complicated because we are talking a little bit about respecting or, or putting together the right incentives. So first we are saying that the homeowner is liable for the home amount of the balance. So this is not seeking uh, help from the government. The second principle or the third principle in this case is that this is not a program for underserving owners. Some people may have a big house, bigger than they deserve. Those people uh, are not going to subscribe to this program. So whatever arrangement uh, is going to be done, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't live in a home that does not belong to you. Uh, 
principle four, which is the objective here, is that the plan as it is designed, it will reduce payments by 50% for those that qualify. Uh, so this is a way to pass on low interest rates to homeowners. The fifth principle is that this has to be dealt by the markets in the way they deal with toxic assets. Uh, and the plan, the, the plan tries to basically a method of how to deal with those toxic assets. And of course, I was telling you that there is a 40% that is left. Here, the government may help uh, by uh, the 40% is like an SPB in which some government coordination may be helpful. I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but before just getting on the ground, let me provide you an example. So we have here a home for $500,000, and the fixed rate mortgage is 400 k and the payment now is almost $3,000, but you can rent elsewhere for $1,500. There is the situation in that uh, some people may lose the jobs, or we know that we are not going to get as high increases as we used to have, which are embedded in all this transaction and why we bought the big home or the expensive home. So right now, a homeowner uh, has to choose either to rent a comparable home for $1,500. The current loan is with the high interest rate. And there is uh, here a payment of the Part A, which is 60%. So if we pay the Part A, it's 60%. And it's even better than renting. So the 60% uh, is better than renting. And there are no incentives for you to move or to try to rent the house. This 60% is good for 30 years. Uh, your rent may go up, but uh, in a fixed mortgage, you know that you pay $1,288 for 30 years, and therefore you're going to be better off than renting. Uh, this is the loan, the 60%. We start with 240 and we go all the way to zero. So in 30 years, not only you're paying, uh, you're better than renting, but your balance of the 240 is going to go down to zero. The balance of the 160, which is the 40 of the plan, is going to grow because you don't have to pay for that. But uh, as it is, is going to grow at 518k at the end of the 30 years. So the question is, for the first 30 years, you're better off than renting. In year 30, you're with your game. And let me tell you what the game is. Today, you're underwater. So your uh, value is, uh, or your equity, is minus 100k. If you keep with the 60-40 plan, you're paying every month. That, that payment is less than renting. And uh, at the end, this, this is the balance including parts A and B. At the end of your 30-year period, your equity is going to be uh, 160. This means that the home has increased at 2.75%. And as a result of that, uh, the value of the home is much higher than Part B. So at this time, so this is an answer for the first 30 years. At the end of your 30-year period, you have either to refinance or clear accounts. Okay. Uh, there is a topic that is a bit complex and I haven't discussed, but. Uh, how the government can help 
with the 40% part. And uh, here, you see what we have here in the US, if you were doing your taxes last week, is there, are, there is the home loan interest deduction. That may be helpful. If you pay a lower interest, your debt is going to grow less. And given the numbers, that easily could be uh, a good direction to go. But then uh, something that happens, and just to be simple, when you put your money in the bank, is that, that there is an insurance. And this is good for everyone. And what happens with the banking insurance is that uh, it restores confidence in the system, and at the end, no one uh, has to pay. So that insurance is never used. It's just that uh, this insurance is good to avoid bank runs. That's the sort of thing that uh, we are proposing here. The government now uh, can issue bonds at 2%. And of course, it is a responsibility of the government, or it should be a responsibility of the government, to provide collateral in some way or another. We are not saying that the government should provide money, but we are saying that it is a responsibility of monetary policy to offer liquidity and confidence to the system. Right now, that confidence is gone, and this is what is uh, causing all these foreclosures. Well, this is it. I'm going to leave uh, the turn to Laurie Goodman that came from New York. Thank you very much, Laurie, for coming.